Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all this craziness today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the horrible murder of a young man named Charlie Howard. Now that name might not sound familiar to you, but... If you saw the 2019 adaptation of It, It Chapter 2, then you have already seen Charlie Howard's murder dramatized on film in the opening scene of It Chapter 2 through the character of Adrian Mellon. And didn't even realize that what you were watching was actually something that really happened. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you about that today. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new Morbid Makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you, yes you, specifically you. So go ahead and do those things and join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. They're both Brat Steam, but no pressure. So now that I'm done basically begging you to be my friend, we can get into this case. Now, I came upon the the story of Charlie Howard and his murder um, because like many people in the world, I saw the remake of Stephen King's It. I was very uh, big fan of the original, saw the remake, and in this reimagination, they had two parts in chapter one, chapter two. So I went in to see chapter two and I left that theater very um, affected by the opening scene of the movie. If you don't remember in the opening scene, a, a gay man is attacked and brutalized just simply for being gay. And for some reason, something about that scene stuck out to me. It didn't really feel like it flowed with the rest of the movie. It felt needlessly um, aggressive and intense. And when I left, I was like, damn, that felt so brutal. And it felt so real that maybe it was. So I got on the Google machine and I looked it up and it turns out that it's because it was real. Charlie Howard was murdered in Bangor, Maine in 1984. And at the time that this happened, Stephen King was actually living in Bangor, Maine. He was in his mid thirties with his wife and his kids. And he was in the middle of writing it when Charlie Howard was murdered in his town. So King found himself moved by Charlie's death, just like a lot of people in that area did at the time. And so he added what happened to Charlie into his book, because in the book of it, it's supposed to take place in a in a place, dairy, where terrible, terrible things happen. So it just kind of made sense that Charlie would be added to that because what happened to Charlie was just that terrible. So once I decided that I wanted to make a video on Charlie's case, I decided to go on YouTube and see how many videos there already were. I just kind of like to see if it's going to be an oversaturated story. I was still going to do it regardless because I felt personally connected to it. But when I looked, I was shocked to find there are like no videos on Charlie's case. There's maybe like one on YouTube. And that blew my mind because it was so brutal and so intense and so important in Bangor, Maine when it happened. And so much has happened since then because of it, that it kind of blew my mind that it's not discussed more because what happened to Charlie was so horrible and he deserves to be remembered and to have his story told. So I'm going to tell you that story today. And while I tell you the story, I'm going to put on a full face of makeup. Now, if that's not your thing, feel free to click off. Thank you for waiting this long. But if you're kind of on the fence and you're like, Hmm, that sounds odd. I'm not sure. Maybe stick around. You might be surprised by how much you like it. So come gather around and let me tell you the story of the tragic murder of Charlie Howard, the inspiration for the gay bashing murder scene in Stephen King's It. Charlie Howard was born Charles O. Howard on January 31st, 1961, making him an Aquarius and he was born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. As Charlie grew up, he was a small boy in stature with a head of blonde hair, and all of this lasted into his young adulthood. As a child, he was often picked on and bullied for a couple of reasons. One, his small size. Two, he was just an overall sickly boy. He suffered from pretty bad asthma, and he didn't really know how to swim. So when his school would take trips to the lake, Charlie would typically sit on the sidelines and watch the others have fun. And three, he knew from a super young age that he, that he was gay, and as we know, it was not something that was common or accepted back then. And I mean, in some places, it's still not super accepted because people are worms. But Charlie, he knew who he was and he was unapologetic about it as one should be. Uh, he would wear whatever he wanted. He would wear heels and a purse and not give a fuck what anybody thought about that. He was really into drawing like women's fashion. And a lot of his friends thought that he would grow up to be a fashion designer. 
So though I think that Charlie being his most authentic self is a is an obvious positive, um, it's not always the easiest choice to make. There are always going to be people who are going to give you shit about it. There's always going to be people who are going to hate you for being different than they are. And especially in high school, man, kids are such dicks. So Charlie got a lot of ridicule from his peers and he actually ended up not even walking at his graduation because he didn't want his family to see how mean the other kids were to him, which is really sad. One of Charlie's teachers uh, growing up had this to say about Charlie and who he was as a person. He was a small, handsome, blonde young man. He was very caring and never angry. He had a lot of potential. He was a risk taker and a pioneer. He never even went to his own prom or graduation because his family feared for his safety. His grave has no marker for fear of reprisals at that time. I believe that had he lived, he would be a prominent advocate and leader. What a shame that was never possible. After graduating high school, Charlie decided that college wasn't really for him. He wasn't a particularly strong academic and he had had some challenges in um, learning in school. He wasn't just like some people's school is just not for them. You know what I mean? It just isn't. Um, so he decided that instead he wanted to up and move his life to a new place with new people, new experience was new experiences where nobody knew his name. Bum, 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 bum. He ended up first landing in a place called Ellsworth, Maine, which was about a three hour drive from his hometown. And while he was there, he had a boyfriend and he did pretty well. But once that relationship ended, he decided he wanted to move again. So he packed up and this time he headed to Bangor, Maine, which was about a 35 minute drive away. Things didn't go super well for Charlie once he ended up in Bangor though. Like, I don't know exactly what was going on with him, but he had a lot of trouble finding work. And because of this and having no job and no money, he actually ended up homeless while he was in Bangor. Two men uh, named Paul and Scott who lived in Bangor. I'm not sure if they were just friends and like roommates or if they were boyfriends. Well, either way, they became friends with Charlie. They befriended him and they actually let him move in with them to kind of give him you know, just a chance out there, get him off the street, help him try to find a job, get things better, improve his life in any way that they could help. After about a month of Charlie living with Paul and Scott, things didn't really seem to be going any better. Charlie still wasn't able to find work. He was still struggling. So Paul and Scott were like, listen, maybe this just isn't the best place for you. And they actually convinced Charlie to move back with his family in New Hampshire. And this seemed like it was going to be a good thing for him when he got back home, which because he listened to them and he went back home, but this did not last. He was only back at home with his family for about a week when he realized like this was not for him. This wasn't a good fit. He remembered why he left in the first place and he just wanted to leave. So he called his friends back up and he's like, listen, I can't do this. And they heard in his voice how much he was mentally suffering. So they were like, fine, you know what, just come back and you can stay with us again. And so he went, back again to Banger. He was just trying to find his place in the world, man. So Charlie went back to Banger and at first, just like before, he was living with Paul and Scott, but things seemed to be different this time around and he seemed to be, something mentally had shifted with him and he seemed to be able to get himself together, get off his, get on his, get off his two feet, get on his own two feet and try to make a better life for himself instead of kind of wallowing in all of his perceived failures. He joined a local church back then it was called the Unitarian church, but now it's known as the brick church. And at the time, this was one of the few places in the eighties where the LGBTQIA community could feel safe and open, just being themselves in a, in a place just accepted in a church. Charlie also joined a local gay rights group that was called interweave. And at this place, he was actually able to make some new friends and find people who not only accepted him for who he was, but embraced him for who he was and celebrated him for who he was. And he was making friends and he was just doing so well, man. He had all these new people in his life. He had a church that accepted him. He was starting to love himself. And this was just six months before he would be murdered. Charlie just seemed like a really nice guy. When I read about him, I was just like, oh, he seemed like a sweetheart. Like, uh, the Easter that he was staying with, uh, with Paul and Scott, he decided he wanted to surprise them. So while they were out of the house, he decorated their entire apartment and like some cute little Easter decorations and then made them like a nice dinner because he was so appreciative of them for letting him come back and stay with them and help him get back on his own two feet. And Charlie wasn't just like standing on his own two feet, man. He was 
thriving. He was doing so well. He was happy. He was completely out of the closet. Like he was out of the closet back home, but now he was completely out of the closet here in Banger and he had all of his friends that made him feel more comfortable. He was completely, you know, himself. He was open. He was just, he just seemed like he had found himself. He had found his people. He was able to completely be himself. He would wear makeup. He would go out and party. He was just like doing the damn thing and living his best life. Charlie was doing so well that he was even able to move out of his friend's house. He got his own little apartment that was just down the street from his church and he even got himself a little kitten. Like he was just, he just sounded like he was doing really well. And it's really sad that he didn't get to really see how good his life could be because he just started having a good life when all of this fucking horrible shit happened to him. People at that time, not all, but a lot, the majority of people at that time were not um, particularly tolerant of Charlie or any gay human beings for that matter. And that's putting it lightly. It's not that they weren't tolerant. They were straight up awful. And obviously I don't mean that everyone in this area at the time was horrible and homophobic because someone's going to take what I say wrong, but the time was really different and there were more people like that and it was more socially acceptable to be open about your distaste for someone just simply because they were gay. Like it affects you in any way at all. Charlie would often get verbally harassed by people when he was just like walking out on the street, just out of nowhere for no reason. And he was the type of guy that instead of like getting pissy or getting mean, he would like turn to them, look at them and blow them kisses in response, which I just think is fantastic. <laughs> but even though Charlie had like a good mental attitude towards, you know, the people who would treat him so poorly, it just, it got so much stupid shit happened. Like at one point he was even at a nightclub with one of his friends and he got kicked out. The people who worked there kicked him out of the nightclub because he was in there dancing with another guy. And they were like, absolutely not. You're not going to do that stuff here, which is just like stupid shit. But it, it went from just like stupid shit like that to dangerous stuff. When one day he came home and I'm just going to tell you, this is a bummer, but that kitten that he got, the kitten that he had gotten when he got his new apartment, he found that kitten dead on his doorstep. Somebody had strangled it. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> so Charlie knew though he wasn't going to tone himself down. He at least needed to be careful because people were dangerous as much as he wanted to just kind of be like, Oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Some people out there were dangerous. And sadly, Charlie was going to get more of that, not less of that. Okay. So now we're going to get in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to Saturday, July 7th, 1984, the last day of Charlie's life. So Charlie had been attending a potluck at Interweave. You remember Interweave? It was that uh, gay rights group that he had joined and he had made all their, all those friends at. Well, after the potluck, he and a friend of his left together, a man named Roy, at about 10 p.m. On the way home, Charlie and Roy passed through a parking lot because Charlie wanted to pick up some of his mail. And once he had, the two started to head home. They had been walking and they were going up State Street when they came upon the Kenduskeg River Bridge. And this is when they noticed a car filled with three teenage boys and two teenage girls that began to slow down near them. These teenagers had apparently been party hopping that night and they had just came from a party and had left to do a quick beer run. They were out driving around looking for someone with an ID to help them buy booze. And they just at this time happened upon Charlie and Roy. So talk about wrong place, wrong time. I hate that. It always is that, isn't it? And these boys decided to take this opportunity to be absolute pieces of human shit. This is when the driver of the car pulled the car over and three teenage boys jumped out of the car and they yelled to Charlie and Roy, Hey, are you guys gay. And this is when Charlie and Roy took off running and these boys started running after them and the girls that were in the car stayed in the car. The three boys ended up catching up to Charlie because he started to experience an asthma attack. As I told you in the beginning, when he was younger, he had bad asthma. This continued into his adult life. So he started having an asthma attack and he ended up tripping and falling to the ground. And this made it easier for these boys to catch him. And once they caught up to him, they started to just beat the crap out of him. They started punching him and kicking him while he lay on the ground, unable to breathe. 
And when this was happening, Roy was just hiding out of sight because honestly, like what, what could he do? I don't know. I don't know what he could do and I don't know what I would do in that situation, but he was hiding out of sight while this was happening. Once these boys were done beating Charlie, they picked him up off the ground and they started leading him to the edge of the bridge that they were on. And this is when Charlie flipped out and started screaming and begging for his life, telling these boys that he didn't know how to swim. As they lifted him over the railing, he grabbed onto the edge and still was like, please, please don't do this. I cannot swim. And these dickheads pried his fingers off the railing and threw him over the edge after beating him into the water 15 feet below. The boys then ran back to the car where the girls were and the girls started it up to take off. And this is when they noticed Roy and they threatened him as they left not to tell anyone not to do anything or they would, you know, do the same thing to him. And they drove off into the night and this is when Roy was like, oh shit. And he took off running, trying to find a phone because this is 1984 and there are no cell phones. So he finally did find a fire alarm on state, state street, state street. And he pulled the fire alarm to alert the ambulances and the police to come. Once the police arrived and Roy told them what had happened, a search immediately started to try to find Charlie, hoping that he was still alive. But I don't think anyone was feeling very positively about this, unfortunately. I don't see how anyone could. It took them a couple of hours of searching, but sadly at about 12.30 a.m. on July 8th, 1984, Charlie's dead body was found floating in three feet of water. Upon doing Charlie's autopsy, it was found that when he went into the water, he suffered from a really bad asthma attack. And because he couldn't breathe and he couldn't swim, he drowned. So while this was happening, while police are searching this freaking river for Charlie's body, these assholes who threw him in the river went back to their party and bragged about what they did. They even refer to the Kanduskeg River Bridge as the, and I quote here, and it's not cool, as the Chuckahoma Bridge. Fucking assholes. The following day, the news of Charlie's murder hit the media, and this is when the boys realized that this man that they threw over had died as a result of it. And fortunately, one of them had a attack of conscience and ended up turning himself in. The girls who were in the car also went to the police and told them what happened, but the other boys freaked out when they found out that they were gonna get into some trouble. So they actually decided that they were gonna jump on a freight train. Never come back. Um, but they ended up changing their mind and they came home. And when they came back home, the police were waiting there to arrest them. These boys made their first court appearance on Monday, July 9th, 1984. This same night, 200 people stood outside the Banger police station with candles to hold a vigil for Charlie. Charlie's memorial service was held at the church that he attended, that he had finally found his acceptance at. And after the funeral service, his friends and his family went to the bridge where he was murdered and they threw flowers over the bridge for Charlie. And this is something that people still do every year to this day in remembrance of Charlie. So when these boys were asked why they did what they did, they said that a couple of days prior to the murders, they had encountered Charlie and they, and Charlie had made some sexual advances towards them. This is what they said. Though just for the record, this was never proven and I don't believe is true, especially since if that was the case, why would they pull over and yell, are you guys gay? Like they would know, you know what I mean? Like it's just stupid, stupid kids trying to figure out a way not to get in trouble for doing something fucking horrible. Initially, they also tried to use the gay panic defense, which don't even get me started on that. The fact of, oh, don't even get me started on that. Anyway, this did not end up working because these kids had already told police, and this is a quote here, that they beat Charlie because they wanted to beat up a, and that they had already done this together before. The response from the majority of the community was disgusting uh, and embarrassing for humanity, in my opinion. Um, instead of being in shock and being outraged, like how could these boys, these freaking teenage boys murder this man for no reason at all? They were more like, well, maybe Charlie should have made better attempts to hide the fact that he was gay and then this wouldn't have happened to him. 
People also thought that these boys should be given leniency because boys will be boys. And they didn't mean to kill Charlie. The three murderers were all minors at the time that they killed Charlie and they were Sean Mabry, who was 16 at the time, James Jim Baines, who was 15 years old, and Daniel Ness, who was 17 years old. All three boys were initially sent to Hancock County Jail, but all of them were released to their parents to await trial. I can't imagine how weird that must have been for their parents to like take them home and know that they're just waiting until they have to take them back to be tried for murder. That's freaking crazy. The prosecution in this case wanted these three boys to be tried as adults because they had committed a pretty, pretty adult crime, in his opinion, and I agree. Attorney General James Tierney wanted the public and these boys to take hate crimes like this seriously, and he thought that he'd be able to set a precedent with these boys and how these types of crimes would be responded to. He wanted these kids and the public to see, and I quote, that Charlie Howard had a mom and family and friends who were devastated at his loss as any of us would be if we had had a loved one who was murdered. A hearing was held on Friday, September 18th, 1984, and this was to determine, for the judge to determine whether or not these boys would be tried as adults or minors. The medical examiner, police officers, witnesses, and psychological examiners were all called to testify at this hearing. After two days, the judge made his, his ruling and he said of this decision, and I quote here, I find that the offense committed was committed in a violent and aggressive and willful manner. I find nothing on the record of this case that would indicate that any of the three have a previous history, record, emotional attitude, or pattern of living that would dictate that they should be treated as adults. So he said that what they did was horrible and willful and hateful and awful, but that they still should not be tried as adults. So despite the prosecution's best efforts, not only were these boys going to be tried as minors instead of adults, but the charges were also changed from murder to manslaughter. And all of the boys pled guilty to manslaughter. And on October 1st, 1984, they were sentenced to the Maine Youth Center for an indeterminate stay, but it was not to exceed their 21st birthdays. So no later than February 28th, 1988, and their records were to be sealed. And real quick, I would really like to know what you guys think about this because I have a lot of feelings and a lot of thoughts, but they're definitely emotional, emotionally fueled. So being unbiased in this is a little bit challenging for me if I'm very honest with you. <sighs> because on one hand, I do get that they are, are kids. 15 is pretty young. However, I think an appropriate punishment would be second degree murder and them being tried as adults because man, what they did is just so effed up. And we have tried younger people as adults before. And what they did was so hateful and just awful. And I just wanna know what you think about that. I just think manslaughter, no, I don't think so. And as minors, they should have, I don't know. It just seems really, really lenient. The judge, though he did not decide to try them as adults, did seem to see that there was broader implications to the murder of Charlie. And he said of this, and I quote, disappointment should be the feeling of everyone when it is recognized that with all that we have available in this great country, we still have prejudice. We still have ignorance and intolerance, which serve as breeders for tragedies such as this. Disappointment that three young people can be so calloused regarding their real values in life that human life becomes secondary to thrill-seeking and pseudo-macho activity. And to that I say, and still we don't try them as adults? Of course, as I'm sure you can imagine, the people out there who really cared about Charlie personally and just this case in general and the implications and the precedent that this sort of ruling made were outraged, as I think they should have been. First, 
to charge them as minors. Then, to give them a plea deal so that they could get manslaughter instead of murder, it just lessens the severity of what they did and shows that, like, it didn't matter, in my opinion. Like, it didn't matter enough to give them a harsher punishment. And that's heartbreaking. James Jim Baines was released from prison after serving only two years. Okay. And Sean Mabry was released after only 22 months in jail. And there's nothing online to say how long that Daniel Ness served. Uh, their records were sealed, so I'm lucky that I was able, ev even able to find out about the other two men. But I'm going to guess that it was something pretty close to the other two. Charlie was buried in an unmarked grave in Orchard Grove Cemetery in Kittery, Maine. Apparently, 25 years after Charlie's murder, I believe it was for the anniversary, I could be wrong on that though, um, the Banger Daily News actually tried to locate three, these three boys, well, men now, uh, to get an interview with them and get their opinions on the case and just kind of see where they were mentally with that now that they were adults. They weren't able to locate Sean Mabry or Daniel Ness, but they did locate James Jim Baines, and he was open to talking with them. He was actually more than open. When they found him, he was still living in Bangor, and he was married and had a couple kids, and he at least seems like what happened, um, what he did changed him as a person and kind of opened his eyes to being a better person and a more open and accepting person. After being released as a young adult, he often went to local schools to discuss tolerance of all people. He addressed the Maine State Legislature in support of a bill to ban discrimination based on sexual orientation. He also co-authored a book called Pentenance alongside author Edward James Armstrong, which was a book about Charlie's murder, and he took part in it just to help. He didn't receive any profit from helping with the book, and he says that he really regrets what he did. And do with that information what you will. I have so much trouble seeing people like this as good people, even if they make positive changes with their life. But I am happy to see that he's trying to do something good with his life and something for the better. He was only 15 when this happened, so you can't you change a lot from that time. And I'm glad to see that with his freedom, he's doing something good and not just sitting around being a hateful son of a bitch. So that's something. Sean Mabry was able to be located later, and he too says that he regrets what he did and regrets what happened to Charlie, and he says that he thinks about Charlie uh, every single day, and in an interview in 1994, he said, and I quote, Charlie Howard was so young. He was helpless that night, and three reckless kids come along and just for the hell of it toss him over the bridge. Because of our actions, Charlie Howard lost his life. In Bangor, Maine, July 7th, the day that Charlie died, is known as Diversity Day, and people go every year and throw flowers off the bridge in remembrance of Charlie. There was also a memorial erected in Charlie's honor in 2009 uh, next to the place where he died. It's a, it's a big stone that has words engraved on it, and the words are... May we, the citizens of Bangor, continue to change the world around us until hatred becomes peacemaking and ignorance becomes understanding. Some absolute assholes, dude, oh my God, I'm so irritated. Some assholes actually went and vandalized this um, stone that was set up for Charlie. They spray painted graffiti all over it and wrote some choice words. I'm not gonna say the words, I'm sure you can guess the words, but this happened in 2011. 2011, dude, May of 2011, so only 10 years ago now. After all this time that he had been gone, some people went there and vandalized his memorial. People still suck, dude. Like how? Why? Are, are you dumb? Are you a big dumb idiot? Fuck off. People who do things like that, fuck right the fuck off. Um, the memorial was restor restored back to its original magic. I don't know the word I'm looking for. It was restored by people who actually cared about him, but I'm just saying like, it was restored by people who cared about him. Sorry, I got a little heated there. Um, but it just goes to show you, this was only 10 years ago. So this is still a problem. This was a problem. It continues to be a problem. None of this happened that long ago. So there's still people out there who are hateful like this. And that's so disappointing. And now my dog's drinking water. So I'll just go fuck myself. 
So now we're gonna fast forward a little bit, talk about Maine as a state and how they have actually taken since this happened a lot of steps to be more progressive in general, particularly when it comes to the LGBTQIA community. They have passed equal rights legislation and they were actually the very first state in the country, I believe, to sign same-sex legislation into law without court action. And you know what's really dumb? The same year that Charlie's uh, memorial stone was erected, this law ended up being overturned, okay, at the polls because, of course, it's very frustrating. But Maine did again become the first state to legalize uh, same-sex marriage in 2012, so. And Maine was the very first state to have an openly gay governor. So go Maine. Oh my God. A famous poet named Mark Doty, Mark Doty, D-O-T-Y, however you pronounce that. Well, he wrote a poem either about Charlie or for Charlie. He was affected by Charlie's death, so he wrote this poem. And I'm gonna read it to you, and I'm gonna try to keep it together, because it's incredibly just like, oh, right there, you know, right there. Between the river and the bridge, he falls through. A huge portion of the night, it is not as if falling is something new. Over and over, he slipped into the gulf, between what he knew and how he was known. What others wanted, opened like an abyss. The laughing stock clerks at the grocery, women at the luncheonettes amused by his gestures. What could he do, live with one hand tied behind his back? So he began to fall into the star-faced section of night, between the trestle and the water because he could not meet a little town's demands. And his earrings shone and his wrists were as limp as they were. I imagine he took the insults in and made of them a place to live. We learn to use the names because they are there. Familiar furniture, that was the bed he slept in. Hard and white, but simple somehow. Queer, something sharp, but finally useful. A tool, all the jokes a chair. Stiff-backed to keep the spine straight. A table, a lamp. And because he's fallen for 23 years, despite whatever awkwardness his flailing arms and legs assume, he is beautiful. And like any good diver has only an edge of fear, he transforms into grace or else he is not afraid, and in this way he climbs back up the ladder of his fall. Out of the river and into the arms of the three teenage boys who hurled him over the edge. Really boys now, afraid. Their father's car's now shivering behind them. Headlights on. And tells them it's all right. That he knows they didn't believe him when he told them he couldn't swim. And blesses his killers in the way that only the dead can afford to forgive. And that, my friends, is the story of the murder of Charlie Howard, the death that was the inspiration of the murder in the opening scene of It Chapter 2 to the character Adrian Mellon. What do you think? I think it's one of the most fucked up things I've ever heard in my life. Uh, it, breaks, it breaks my heart. And when I watch the movie, which if you haven't seen it, um, it's fine. The original is so, so much better. But the original doesn't include the scene that we're talking about. It's in the book, not in the original movie, but it is in the remake. Anyway, when I watched it, when I watched it, it really, really bothered me, that scene. And I found myself really affected and I found myself tearing up. And it was weird because like, I watch a lot of scary movies. Horror movies are kind of my thing. So I, I'm not one to typically be affected by fiction in that way. It just felt incredibly real. And I found myself having a lot of trouble separating in my mind and seeing the scene as like a light-hearted fun like scary movie it's just you know what i'm you know what i mean when you watch a scary movie but for whatever reason i could not separate that in my head because of the content and to be fair i do have a soft spot for these types of cases hate crimes against any group of marginalized people really really gets under my skin and i have a hard time compartmentalizing my feelings regarding those types of cases so anyway, when I watched it, I couldn't get it out of my head. And then to go online and find out that it was real was insane to me. And it made sense why it affected me so much. And because it just felt very real. And then to see that most people don't know about this case was, was mind blowing. And I felt like people needed to know. They needed to see what happened here, what happened to Charlie and see how these kids essentially got a slap on the wrist for murdering someone. I can't imagine living in that area at that time and having something like that happen so close to home. And I can completely see why Stephen King, a writer, would be affected by that enough to write it in this book when the book It is a book about 
actual nightmares. Stephen King said of the murder of Charlie Howard, and I quote, at the time I started writing it, the Howard murder had just happened. It was fresh in my mind and it fitted my idea of Derry as a place where terrible things happened. And maybe needless to say, I was outraged. It was a hate crime. In 2014, he also said of the crime, and I quote, I think the death of Charlie Howard shocked people in the Bangor area out of their complacency about matters of sexual preference and prejudice. I know it did me. It's easy enough to see what happened as a stupid crime, a kind of felonious accident fueled by booze, hazing that got out of hand. Probably too easy. In the aftermath of this inoffensive young man's death, the community underwent a period of self-examination that hasn't ended to this day. To me, that suggests one good thing came out of Charlie Howard's death, but when I look back on it, I'm still overcome with feelings of sadness and shame. I don't feel responsible exactly, and I never lay that on the community, but it's our town. We live here, which means that we have to live with Charlie, and we have to continue trying to make this right. And that line gets to me that we have to continue trying to make this right because that line applies to us as a human race, my dudes, just in general. Things like this should not happen and nobody should ever be targeted or hurt or killed for their sexuality. And that's a hill that I'm willing to die on. And if you disagree, please don't even say anything because we are so far removed from one another. We are not going to meet in the middle on this. There's not really a compromise in my mind on this. Um, it's not going to be received well if you, if you disagree, like if you're a dick about it. And um, in, I'm open, I'm okay with saying this, that in my humble opinion, if you feel negatively towards a person based on their sexuality and hate someone because of who they love, um, that's fucking stupid. So that's how I feel. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope that you found it interesting and informative and that you're taking something positive away from Charlie's story. And of course, I want to thank you for sitting down and hanging out and remembering Charlie Howard with me today because what happened to him is so horrible. It never should have happened. It seems like it could have been very avoidable. And I just wish he had been born at a different time. You know what I mean? But that's not what happened. And unfortunately, he's gone forever. So it's fucked up. Please let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below. As you guys may or may not know, I have a very, very long list of cases, but every time you add a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it to give you a shout out because I know you're filled with good taste and good ideas. Otherwise you would not be here. Of course, make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. And if you want to follow me on any of my other social media, everything will be listed down below. We got Instagram, Twitter, Facebook page, and Facebook group. Everything is linked for you. And also down below is all the makeup products I use, earrings, nail polish, all that jazz. I always list it for you in case you want to know what the stick red lip is so that you can get it yourself. It's all down below for your convenience. And with all of that said, I want to just thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That's tight. You're tight. Please be safe and just be a better person than you were yesterday. Let's try to be open and true, authentic versions of ourselves, of ourselves, just like Charlie was. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I'll see you in my next video.